Lieutenant Cannon from Merville High School, JRTC, request permission to present the colors. Permission granted. Color guard, present colors, March. One first colors, March. So I'd like to thank our student performers from the Leithwalk Elementary School 2019 Glee Club under the direction of Ms. Beatrix Greiner. We'd like to thank Dylan Burton, Carter Harrison, Marquise McGregor, Alyssa Palmer, Rita Folks, Jamira Hawkins, Jordan Boney, Sanaya Smith, Dylan Hall, Sheldon Smith, Ayana Garrix, and Dion Walker. Thank you very much. We'd also like to thank the Mervo JROTC, Cadet Commander Kyle Parham, Cadet Promise Cannon, Cadet Zora Cabell, Cadet Laquan Jefferson, and Cadet Derek Rivers. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to now ask Commissioner Chinia to lead us in a moment of silence. I'd like you to, uh, to join me in a moment of silence, um, recognizing the passing of one of our retired um, administrators from Baltimore City Schools. On May 3rd, 2019, Bridget Dean um, of Baltimore passed. She was an employee of the Baltimore City Public School System for 39 years, where she served in multiple capacities, retiring as principal of Charles Carroll Barrister Elementary School. Having volunteered tirelessly in her community since young adulthood, Bridget touched and reached countless lives. Please join me, please, uh, for a moment of silence. Thank you. I'm so sorry about that. For the record, we just voted.
to approve eight to zero with one absent the prior closed session meeting minutes and the prior open uh, closed session summary. Sorry about that. I'd like to now ask, we're going to have some committee reports from committees that have met since the last board meeting uh, for the general public. These meetings were all conducted in public. Um, the minutes of those are, the tapes are available, but the, these are just highlights from those meetings. So I'd like to turn first to Commissioner Bondima, who chairs the Operations Committee. Yes, the Operations Committee was held last week in, here in the room, 200 East North Avenue, in the first floor boardroom in this room. And... Um, we had quite great, good discussions about the previous approved capital improvement programs and the status of each of the programs. And um, we stayed capital funding review, um, IAC recommendation for city schools as of um, May 9th, contingency funds, CIP discussion points and timeline. And also we had a lengthy discussion about the city schools air condition conditioning plans and funds related to the plans. Um, quite an um, interesting discussion on enrollment trends, births and enrollment for uh, kindergarten enrollment, and also looking at Baltimore enrollment and housing <coughs> and the data that was related to it and projections for the year. And um, the next meeting will be at, um, let's see, uh, Tuesday, June 18th, 2019 at 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. in this room. So uh, the public is welcome to attend the meetings and, um, and, um, and observe it on the, on, online and um, on TV. Thank you very much. Commissioner Hassan on the policy committee meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Kashani. Um, the policy <laughs> committee met last week on Tuesday. We discussed three policies. Policy JJA, which was student clubs, the, um, uh, the the purpose of this is to ensure that students, especially secondary students, are able to have agency and develop clubs and organizations for themselves. Uh, and the policy helps just solidify the role of the faculty advisor, access to facilities, um, and some pieces like that. All of these policies are open for public comment at policy at bcps k12.md.us. Um, if students would like to weigh in, we'd love to get some more student input on that policy specifically. We also talked about policy GCO, which is employee evaluations, um, looking at the evaluation system, the frequency, and the manner in which employee evaluations will be conducted. We had some uh, great public input comment and some discussion amongst the board members uh, that we hope that the drafters of that policy will be very cognizant of our understanding that informal or formal unannounced visits are probably something that we don't want to see for our employees, that we want um, the employees to know when their formal evaluations are happening so that they can prepare appropriately and present the best of themselves. Uh, the last policy we talked about was policy IHB, which is public charter schools. Um, a lot of information in there, and again, as similar to the student clubs, for us as a committee, not nearly enough public input. So really hoping to get some feedback from operators, from families, uh, as well as from families that attend traditional, traditional schools to make sure that we get that policy done well. Our next meeting um, will be on June 19th, the same day as operations, from 3.30 to 5.30 in this room. Um, and we do all have public comment at that that session. So I encourage anyone to sign up at the board at bcps.k12.md.us uh, beginning the Thursday before the meeting. Uh, next time we will be discussing um, policy GLCE telecommuting and possibly a conversation about financial planning. Um, but we're waiting on the, that confirmed agenda to happen. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Berkeley on teaching and learning. Commissioner Berkeley on teaching and learning. Um, the Teaching and Learning Committee met last on May 7th at 3.30 here in this room, and we had an update on graduation and dropout numbers. We had an update on the um, implementation of the blueprint, and um, we also discussed charter school policy and compliance with that policy. We meet next on Tuesday, June 4th um, at 3.30 in this room. Thank you. Periodically, we have presentations from organizations who are doing uh, terrific work in city schools but may not be as well known. We thought we were going to have a presentation from Beats Not Bullets, but we're not sure they're here. 
doesn't look, look like they're here. Um, this was recommended to us by a, a partner of ours, and so we will reschedule them for a future time. The only other thing I want to note is this, the, the timing and scheduling of this meeting tonight is a little different because when this uh, first part of the public meeting ends, we will transition pretty quickly um, to the second part of the meeting, which will focus on the four charter school applications. Um, so we will we'll pause. We, we will likely not really leave, but we'll, we will pause and then just transition seamlessly into the next part of the meeting where we'll hear uh, brief presentations from the four applicants. Um, there'll be time for questions, but this is just an information gathering, question taking, and then we'll be, we will be voting on those applications on June 11th. Okay, I want to look at the, um, uh, the PEP and appeals and hearings. Um, do I have a motion to approve the PEP agenda and the five appeals and hearings cases? Moved by Commissioner Reed, second by Commissioner Richardson. All in favor? Motion passes uh, Hassan. Bondima, Chinia, Kashani, Reed, Frank, Berkeley, Richardson. Motion passes eight to zero. And with that, I'd like to turn it to Dr. Santelisis. Thank you, Chair Kashani. Um, I would like to at this time invite Chief Grant Skinner for this evening's PEP agenda. Good afternoon, Dr. Santelisis and commissioners. Uh, we have five appointments this evening, and uh, three folks are here with us, so if they can stand to be recognized when I call their name. Uh, first, Kara Ball, currently teacher at DeLaleo Elementary School uh, for the Department of Defense Education Activity, is appointed Educational Specialist 2 for Elementary Science, uh, effective June 17th. Uh, next. Uh, Benjamin Roberts, currently principal in Prince George's County Public Schools, is appointed principal at Franklin Square Elementary Middle School, effective July 1st. <laughs> Ashanti Chambers, currently principal resident at Mary Ann Wint Winterling Elementary at Bentleu, is appointed principal at Leithwalk Elementary Middle School, effective July 1st. <laughs> Eugenia Young, currently interim principal at Youth Opportunity, is appointed principal at Excel Academy at Francis M. Wood High School, effective July 1st. And Federico Adams, currently principal at William Penderhughes Elementary Middle School, is reassigned principal at Youth Opportunity, effective July 1st. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Chief Grant Skinner, as is um, our custom. I would ask, um, when I call your name, each of the principal candidates who are now officially, um, after the board takes their vote, will officially be appointed. If you could stand, um, because school leaders are some of the most in important positions we have in the district. I'd like to read a little bit of background on each of our newly appointed principals. So if, if Principal Ashanti Chambers could stand. Um, Principal Chambers came to city school, schools from Brooklyn, New York. I will say we shared some Brooklyn stories when we were uh, interviewing. This year, she served as a principal resident at Marianne Winterling Elementary School and Hempstead Hill Academy. I will also say to both of those principals, uh, she spoke of her uh, interning time uh, quite warmly, which is not always the case, so that you two should take a bow as well. She has also served as a literacy representative, classroom teacher, mentor for elementary and middle schools and city schools. Ms. Chambers raised student achievement, built meaningful and long-lasting relationships, and promoted a positive climate and culture. She holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, a master's in teaching from the Johns Hopkins University, and a master's in doctorate of education in organizational leadership from Grand Canyon University. Congratulations, Dr. Chambers. If Principal Benjamin Eric Roberts could stand. 
Principal Roberts returns to city schools from Prince George's County Public Schools where he served for two years as a K through eight principal of Imagine Lincoln Public Charter School. Previously, he served as an assistant principal and student support liaison for Baltimore City Schools. Mr. Roberts began his career in education as a middle school math teacher and guidance counselor in Ohio. Mr. Roberts believes in servant leadership, often reciting his favorite poem, House by the Side of the Road by Sam Walter Foss. He holds a bachelor's degree from Florida A&M, fam you, and master's degrees from the University of Dayton and University of Cincinnati. Welcome back, Principal Roberts. And then finally, Principal Eugenia Young. Principal Young served this year as the interim principal of Youth Opportunity High School, one of our alternative programs. Previously, she served for four years as principal at Roosevelt State High School in DC Public Schools. Her strong ability to build a positive learning environment and great rapport has resulted in a 20% percentage point increase in student attendance at Youth Opportunity this year. That is not easy to do. She is passionate about giving students access and opportunities to explore college and career exploration and wants to continue being able to provide paid internships and job shadowing for all students. She holds a bachelor's degree from California State University Fresno and an executive master's degree from Georgetown University. Welcome and congratulations, Principal Eugenia Young. Very good. Uh, moving on, um, I would like to begin my official comments this evening with a presentation about a unique collaboration between city schools and our partners at Baltimore Clayworks. Last September, Baltimore Clayworks initiated a project that gives students with disabilities who attend Baltimore Transitions Connections the opportunity to learn ceramic skills, studio maintenance, and how to prepare an exhibition, along with many internships on the Clayworks campus as a step towards employment. I am very excited to hear from the students themselves about their positive experience working in clay and talking about what they have learned. Let's welcome City Schools teacher, Ms. Elise Collier, uh, Pat Halley, Baltimore Clay Works trustee and longtime friend of City Schools, uh, Nicole Fall, Baltimore Clay Works community arts manager, Wes Brown, Clay Works workforce development teacher, and our students, Tevin Powell, Stephanie Blades, and Devonte Bay. And if you need more seats, feel free to take some from the row right behind you. That is absolutely fine. Um, hi, I'm Nicole Fall, a community arts manager at Baltimore Clayworks. And Ms. Santalisa, Dr. Santalisa gave us this great introduction. Um, so it was a partnership that uh, came together because of Pat Halley and Jeff Wyatt. Is Jeff, Jeff, can you stand up? Oh, there we are. So Jeff, so without, go ahead, I'm sorry. Without Jeff and Pat, uh, it, would, it would have been very difficult to make this happen. So, uh, you know, Jeff's been wonderful in terms of, um, you know, making this program happen um, as the secondary transition services facilitator. Um, and Donna White, the coordinator of Citywide Services, also played a role. And certainly our teachers, our artist teachers, uh, Wes Brown, who is a resident artist at Clayworks, uh, but who is also teaches at Bard High School Early College. He teaches ceramics there. And um, then there's Anna Maria Economou and Joanna Mary. So I want to hand this over to the students and to Ms. Collier uh, to talk about the program. And to what, yeah, go ahead. Excuse me, good evening, everyone. As you already heard our introduction, we are from the Baltimore Transition Connection. Oh, we record. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're from the Baltimore Transition Connection program. Myself, Elise Kyle, you're the classroom teacher, and we also have an assistant, Ms. Glenda Wise, where we take the students to play work three days a week, 
so that they can perform the duties that they need to do. At this time, we're going to turn it over to them, and they have some of their work. We're going to start with Mr. Tevin Powell, who will give some information about his work. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Tevin Powell, and at Clayworks, I like to... Um, I build a uh, dinosaur house, mirrors, um, cups, mugs, towels, and in the box. And I learned how to uh, communicate, work to work together, and and communicate. And uh. I'm working this summer at Ronald McDonald House, and I will take my skills from Clayworks to my job. Next, we will have the Vontae Bay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Devonte Bay. My name is Devontae Bay, and I learned at Clayworks to work together, um, communicate, and um, work good with others. And I had learned a lot at Clayworks. And I had made a box. I had made a W. I had made two bowls at Clayworks. I really like Clayworks. I like the instructor, Mr. West, because he helped me verbally. And I like that experience that I had. And, you know, I really enjoy it. And, you know, every time when I make clay, it made me feel relaxed. What I like. And um, I had learned a lot at Clayworks, what I'm proud of. And um, I'll be working this summer. And I'll be working at the Elephant Restaurant. And I, I would take the experience that I had at Clayworks to the Elephant Restaurant. And I would learn how to communicate and work with others. Thank you. And last we will have oh. Ms. Def oh, excuse me, oh. that's right, short piece. It is the box that I mean. Mm -hmm. oh. And last but not least, Ms. Stephanie Blades. Good afternoon, my name is Stephanie Blades and at Clayworks I've been I'm an artist like Mr. West, but not as good as him. But um, he's been teaching me how to bring my drawings to life out of clay. And right here, this is what Mr. West taught me how to make out of life, this dolphin. And I like this going to clay works and bringing all my pieces to life and like just creating stuff. And Mr. West is a really good teacher and I like going to clay works and learning a lot of new stuff. Every time I go to Clayworks, I learn something new. And this summer, they offer me a job for two days a week. And I'm going to be working with another classmate, too. And I think I can bring the skills to Clayworks. And I think I can bring um, my, I think this can turn into a real job, like a full-time job. Thank you. Do any of the board members have questions? Is, was that it, or did you? Um, yeah, they did have, uh, and the slides would oh, show please, it. Oh, please, go ahead. They, 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 they had uh, an art exhibit of their work, oh, and they also sold their work. So uh, they had that opportunity to, um, to pr put on the show, to arrange everything, and it worked sure. out really well. You can take us through the slides. I didn't mean to preempt it. How do, I don't know how to do Oh, the clicker's right there. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'll just, how do you? Uh, 
Um, and the important thing is the uh, on the slide is that it was the whole program has been funded by the Baltimore Children and Youth Fund. Nice. Um, and so you can see there's their teacher, Mr. Wes, um, and the students working in the classroom with Ms. Collier. And they're and they're outside. Um, they're outside drawing on the campus. More classroom shots. And here they are setting up for their show and their teachers on the far left, Mr. West Brown, and they're unwrapping their work and they're going to place it in the exhibit. And here is the opening for the exhibit and they're talking to people who've come to the reception and quite a few of them sold their work. And so it was really great to see the students uh, feeling, you, got, you all felt really comfortable talking to people who came in and they would show and talk about their work. Uh, and they all, all wrote artist statements as well. Um, and you can kind of see one on the wall there and Wes is talking to them. Uh, and they all wrote artist statements. So they are practicing literacy skills too. So that was it. Thank you very much. I just have a, a question and a, I guess a comment. How, who, if you said this, I apologize. I was getting reattached to my computer system here. Um, who, who does, how do children, who students get to participate in the program? Well, so it just happened that we, uh, we coordinated with Jeff and Jeff got us the students and we were in, inaugurating the program. So, you know, it's a matter, you know, if we did it again, you know, that's another thing that we would have to work out is like, how do you select students for the program? And so I think they all came, they all came from a program that was at BCCC. Okay. Great. And my comment is I'm just not surprised that Pat Halley's involved in doing something awesome for young people. Like, I'm just so not surprised. She's an awesome uh, potter. Like, let's just start there. But you've done so much for city schools and for students in this city that um, everybody's really grateful for, for you. I think this represents sort of a, a unique, both for Clayworks to work with students and give this kind of art and work skills development opportunity, and for city schools to see an arts-based curriculum as a place where students can learn job skills. So it's really been a, a very exciting beginning that, that we want to continue. Thanks to you for getting us started. Commissioner Hassan. We have one, one, more, one more board member comment. So I just want to extend a, a second thank you to the Baltimore Youth and Children's Fund uh, for really understanding the whole child and the needs of the whole child. Um, you helped support a playground build that Commissioner Bandima and I were a part of a few weeks ago. So looking at, at play and at, at artistic um, output and job workforce development and self-advocacy and agency, uh, and we do as much as we can with the budget we have, but without our community partners, mm -hmm. we would not be able to do the extras and the even more, um, and frosting deserves cake. So we're very appreciative. Thank you. Great. Good, good. Well, on? thank you again, and we want to thank all of you, particularly the young people, uh, for coming out and sharing your stories and your learning and just uh, reminding us, um, as Pat just did, of the importance of art in supporting uh, overall learning and development. So thank you all for that. Um, <clears throat> moving on, uh, last month, um, our dedicated family and community engagement team hosted uh, what we hope will now be an annual um, evening, our International Family Night. And I have to say, um, there has never been a more appropriate time to celebrate the rich cultural diversity that we enjoy, not only in Baltimore City, but also in city schools. Um, English learners in city schools come from more than 80 countries and speak more than 60 different languages. Uh, we are truly blessed to include the full spectrum of colors, religions, cultures, ethnic groups in our student body. Uh, we really are 
quite frankly, a uh, rainbow of human possibility. Uh, we don't fear difference here, we celebrate it because we know that immigration and the diversity it creates is the single greatest resource that, a, that our country enjoys. Uh, it truly remains a source of our nation and our city's strength. Uh, I will say that I attended and really thoroughly enjoyed International Family Night. We had representatives from across the city. Um, there were families who literally had only been in our nation or our city uh, for weeks, but were excited to attend this event. Uh, wonderful turnout, and again, I think one of the only um, repercussions of a great, uh, fantastic success the first time out is now I've asked family and community engagement to make this an annual uh, event. So uh, without further ado, our fabulous uh, student reporting team here at City Schools was there. Um, and this is a brief uh, uh, couple of minute video that they created. Uh, Amani, I have seen, I don't think Amani's here tonight, but um, she and the team really get around uh, to events in the city. So without further ado, I will let Amani and the student uh, reporting team uh, tell you a little bit more about our first International Family Night. Hey, this is Imani from the City School Student Media Team here at the Columbus Center to check out the very first ever International Family Night. It's all about celebrating the diversity of our families from all across City Schools. It's going to be a fun night, so let's check it out. Families coming out, having fun together. Right, being able to celebrate one another and just like the diversity of our schools and our city is on full display. These are our families. These are city schools families. I'm excited for see the different cultures. I'm so excited too, you know? So I'm so happy. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> it just brings a wealth of culture and knowledge and experience that all of our kids and families can benefit from. It's important for families to be able to come together for, um, for good reasons like literacy and just education in general. So it brings you together and it makes life fun in a learning environment. It's important for me to have an event like this because we can see the community, how it's growing and how supportive we can be one to another one. I find a lot of good things here today, a lot of information for the Hispanic community. So can you tell us what the most fun has been for you tonight? Um, like the songs and everything, um, talking about um, other cultures like um, Africans, Latin and uh, American. It's important because we want to make people happy like celebrating for uh, Baltimore Public School. How is food important to a culture? I feel like you can express yourself through food and stuff like that. Food is usually the binding thing, and in families, that's usually the thing that gets you together. It's absolutely a part of the culture. It's a lot of different things that, you know, like if this table don't work for you, then this one will, as well as it, you know, it intrigues you to want to know more. You know, and actually for me, being City School alumni, I always support things of this order. Do you think the information being provided here will be truly beneficial to the families? Oh, absolutely. And you can see like everything from like literacy support, medical information, resources across the city for a number of our families who might be immigrants to our country. This is a great place to get connected. Uh, find out how to help your child be successful in school. City schools really appreciates them. And we are so honored that they have chosen to come to Baltimore City Public Schools and that they bring to rich diversity and history and culture to our district. To feel accepted and to feel important and to know that they belong in the community and that they are all loved. We have just seen some amazing performances, ate some delicious food, and got access to resources for all of our families here. This night was so important because it gives us an opportunity to connect with different families throughout Baltimore City. I'm Imani Humphrey Torres with the City School Student Media Team. See you next time. So I just, I really do want to thank again our family and community engagement team for just fabulous work, uh, the phenomenal student media team, and really all of our international families, which really made that night a success. 
Um, and by the way, FYI, part of why I was talking that loud was because it, the music literally was that loud. It wasn't that I had earplugs on and couldn't hear myself. Um, it, was, it was quite a joyous time. Um, and then finally, I will end uh, with a reminder that tomorrow morning at 10.30, we will hold our second annual Day of Peace and Remembrance to honor the memory um, of 12 students who died from violence uh, in this current 18-19 school year. The ceremony will be conducted here at North Avenue on the front steps of the district office and at schools throughout the city. I invite everyone to participate in what is uh, and what was last year a very solemn event, um, but in a lot of ways I heard from staff and other participants um, was a way for us all to come together uh, to just process in a small way um, the fact that whenever we lose our city's young people, we lose individuals. We don't lose clusters. We don't lose names. We don't lose numbers. We lose individuals that hold promise and purpose. And so this event is one way that we as the city schools community come together um, to acknowledge that and acknowledge the fact that we need to work harder to make sure that our city is safe and nurturing for our youngest citizens. And with that, I will turn it back over to Chair Kashani. Thank you, Dr. Santelisis. What I'd like to do now is to um, walk through the items on the consent agenda, including the procurement items. Um, if you want to pull anything, please say what it is and what your questions are so staff can be prepared later in the meeting to respond. First item is um, under consent is item 8.01, the school program renaming request for Cherry Hill Elementary Middle. Second item is 8.02, school building renaming request, Fairmount Harford. That's the next one. Okay. Um, that's okay. No, you're good. You're good. I'm, that, that's good. Um, item 8.03, uh, well, it's the one after. Item 8.03, school program renaming request, Brems Lane Public Charter School. Item 8.04, school program renaming, William Pinderhughes Elementary Middle. Do you want to pull that? Yeah. What's your question on it? A question about the, the term academy. Okay. So um, we're going to pull it. Commissioner Frank wants to ask a question about the use of the term academy. And I actually also want to pull it because when we, the information in the presentation showed the votes, um, we, we asked both uh, the students and community to vote. In the student vote, it was really, really close between uh, the Sandtown name on the school and the Ethel Ennis name. Very close vote on the community vote. It was way less close, and Ethel Ennis was the winning vote. And we did the, the, just the recommendation to the board is that we pick the Sandtown name because it was the student vote. And so my question is, if we're going to ask the community for their input, why don't we take it? So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, Next, I'd like to look at, so we're going to pull item 8.04. So the first three, 8.01, 2, and 3, will go by consent. Under procurement, um, questions on 11.01, Cloverland Farms Dairy. Item 12.01, Software Maintenance and Support. I'd like to pull that one, please. Uh, Commissioner Hassan's going to pull that. Um, and your questions? Uh, for... I'm guessing it can't be ready for it this evening, but for a number of years we've been asking for an overall long-term technology plan. Um, and these are annual recurring amounts. They're substantial. Um, I'd just like to see how it fits in with, with the big plan. And I know that answer probably can't be given, but I'd like to formally ask that question. Tonight. Yeah, we have been asking for that for years because for the non-tech savvy, which... I certainly fall in that category. It's so hard to tell what these right, and it's, all are. it's hard to make sure we're doing our fiduciary responsibility without seeing a whole piece. So it makes it hard to vote on. So. I also have questions on this. Um, it has to do with uh, the cybersecurity <coughs> portion. Um, 
I suspect we're all interested in this, given what's going on with Baltimore City and their systems right now. And I want to thank Ms. Trueheart for flagging some of the specific questions that I'm going to raise. So thank you very much for that. Um, so from what I can tell from the item, one of the items has to do with only one of the laundry list of items uh, for daily computers for 103,000 specifically um, deals with cybersecurity. So I have a number of questions um, that really dig down deeper into what, what have we put in place in terms of insurance to help us with that. And $103,000 doesn't seem, it's, there's probably more, but I can't tell from those descriptions if there's something else having to do with uh, cybersecurity. A, a number of them reference maintenance and risk. So I, I think there's a lot more in there, but it's a little hard to tease out. So we, I think we want to pull that item for discussion. Um, next procurement item, uh, 13.01, Adisa Enterprises, LLC, ALEC, LLC, and C&W Construction. Uh, then we've got three that have to do with janitorial services. The first one is a set of vendors, 13.02 for janitorial services. I actually want to pull that one because I'd like to ask some questions about how we monitor compliance for the green cleaning supplies. And that's 13.02. 13.02. That's the one I want to pull, 13.02. Uh -huh. Items 13.03, uh, interline brands, supply works. I also want to pull that. Um, that the request for an increase in contract more than doubles the uh, originally approved contract, and it wasn't very long ago that we approved this contract, and so I was curious. It's like more than double from 500,000 to 1.1 million. So I want to pull that. And item 13.04, interline brands, uh, it's for two different, uh, two different items. Um, I also want to pull that same question. The original contract was for $250,000. And again, within like a year of approving, a, a year and a half of approval of that contract, it's more than tripling in amount. And I, I really want to know, what do we know now that we didn't know then? It's, it's a relatively short period of time. So I want to pull 1302, 1303, and 1304. So with that, um, 8010203 will go, go by consent, 11.01 and 13.01 will go by consent and we'll pull the other ones. Okay. Um, because I like to honor our commitment to not starting public comment until six, I'd like to ask staff who are gonna present item 18.01, the, the 2019 Comprehensive Educational Facilities Master Plan to do that now and then we'll get back on schedule with um, public comment. Good evening, Board of Commissioners and Dr. Santelises. I'm Nicole Stewart, the Director of Facilities Planning and Real Estate. And today I'll be presenting the Comprehensive Educational Facilities Master Plan, or the CEFMP, for 2019. So as required by the Interagency Commission on School Construction, City Schools is required to submit a CEFMP every year. It's primarily a tool for communicating uh, how facility goals and guidelines are aligned with academic goals. And the document is also a repository for, for facility information, um, as well as context about the neighborhoods where our schools are located and also the neighborhoods where our students live. So as part of the CEFMP uh, process facilities planning, we developed the 10-year enrollment projections. We developed the utilization report that is also required by our MOU um, as part of the 21st century agreement. In addition, we also provide demographic information about what's happening across the city. And so what we're, what we're doing this year is digging in a little bit more on those enrollment trends and births and uh, enrollment and how those things are related. We're also 
looking at the intersection between enrollment and housing. And then we, since we now have uh, a number of 21st century schools that are open, we are producing uh, what are just basic profiles with facility information so that we understand uh, sort of the movement of students into our new buildings as well as how well those buildings are utilized. And we're con just continuing to expand data visualization and story maps, and so we'll just give a snapshot of what we're doing there. So, I'm not quite sure what's going on with the slides. Okay. Okay. I don't know. Not sure which version this is, but I think we'll, we'll see. Okay. All right. All right. So as many of you, know, uh, as I mentioned before, we will uh, just be uh, sort of just going through what the enrollment trends have been and just digging a little bit deeper on the connection between enrollment and demographics. And as you all are aware, we are in our fourth consecutive year of enrollment decline since our most recent peak. Uh, and uh, what we've uh, found is we've been exploring these different factors. Um, we have uh, looked at what that, how that trend correlates with um, other things that are going on in the city. So, so to understand that relationship, we look at a number of different factors. We look at the number of births. We look at birth rates. We look at uh, kindergarten enrollment and capture rate. And what we found is our past, current, and projected enrollment is definitely being driven by births. Uh, what emerges is really these two time periods that I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what happened during those time periods. Uh, when we look at these different data elements, it's uh, more helpful to look, look at the general trend. If you go and look at any specific year, um, there, all, the, all the different elements might not be changing in the same direction or at the same magnitude, but definitely what has emerged is these uh, two different time periods prior to the most recent recession and then right after the recession. So prior to the recession, which was in 2007 through 2009, uh, nationally, birth rates had reached their peak in 2007. In fact, that's the highest birth rate ever recorded um, in the U.S. And we we see those similar trends in Baltimore City, where we have an increase of births. We have really it what is just emphasizing how different these trends are. We have not seen a capture rate this high in the last 40 years of data that we looked at. 
the average cap capture rate between that time period is about 70%. And so what you see in those years uh, a little bit prior and during the recession is these huge increases in capture rate, birth rate, and births. Can you just define capture rate, please? So capture rate is the number of births divided by K enrollment six years later. So then what we see when we look at the um, time period just after the recession, we can see that all of those trends are reversing in terms of the number of births. So we experience uh, large birth declines. The uh, birth rate has gone down to what it's been in previous years. The capture rate is still a bit higher than it's been over time. Uh, I do partially attribute that to, uh, as I said, not everything changing in the same year. And we know that the birth information that we have is um, a calendar year and not a school year. So I think that also plays into uh, why we might continue to see a higher capture rate uh, for those years when we are experiencing those declines. But we can definitely see along with those birth rates that decrease in kindergarten enrollment during that time period. And so what we wanted to do is also just more directly talk about that link between births and kindergarten enrollment. And the reason why is because when, we're, when we get to our enrollment projections, which we produce every year, we, are, um, uh, we will likely continue to see some of these trends impacting enrollment. So following that decrease of births after the recession, uh, we can see that um, six years later, our kindergarten cohort Right at 15, 16, when we start to see that enrollment decline, we can see uh, that kindergarten cohort and the first grade cohort really becoming smaller. And what we've seen over time is those, um, that kindergarten cohort transitions and progresses through the grades, how they have contributed to um, declining enrollment at those grades in those years. And so this is, these numbers here are year-over-year year changes. So as an example, in school year 16, uh, kindergarten decreased by about 600. Uh, and so one question we've gotten also is about uh, kindergarten enrollment across Baltimore City. So how much of this is uh, students attending private schools. So what we did is we used American Community Survey data to then map by the community statistical areas the uh, neighborhoods that have and the counts of neighborhoods or the counts of kindergarten students attending private school across all the different neighborhoods. And we can see a couple different things. One is that uh, for those that do have higher numbers of kindergartens attending public school, they're concentrated in the nor northwest area of the city. Uh, some of the neighborhoods in the southwest and the northeast that do have high concentrations of um, private kindergarten enrollment uh, attendees are those where we just have a, a lot of students. So, um, and Bella Addison is an example of, uh, on this map, it shows having a high number of kindergartners in private school, but that's also likely linked to the fact that there are just so many uh, young people who live in those neighborhoods. And the one point, the last point about this, I think that is helpful is looking at the percent. So the chart at the bottom looks at the, based on the American Community Survey, uh, they take a total number of uh, kindergartners who live in Baltimore City and then look at uh, the percentages of them who are enrolled in public private school across the city. Just a, just a comment, a qu question here. This is uh, really uh, helpful information, um, particularly you know, some of the trend data and births, and it's just helpful. Um, it just also flags for me the, the work that was done by the Enrollment Task Force, particularly, I think, um, Annie's group, who, who, who honed in and said, that's our target. That's the target is those early, early years. So, I mean, it, it, this even shines a stronger spotlight on that for me. And I know Tina's on it, and she's now carrying around that bucket of to-do items, so it's, it's good. Question on this slide? Yes. Um, am I misreading it? The, the column 13 to 17, 83,341 8, children were enrolled in our schools, and in the previous years it was 7170. So that looks like 
very positive news in among what is relatively grim. What if, am I misreading it, or is that accurate? So that number is the total number of kindergartners who live in Baltimore City. And so, and then that number is pulled directly from the American Community Survey. So we will get to some more specific information about what's, um, what the numbers are within, uh, within it, the school district, but this one is more so to show um, the rates of the kindergartners who were in public versus private. Right, but the number is significantly higher, not mm -hmm. a little bit, and our 83% for public remains the same. So why is that not good news? Very good news. So it is good news, but it reflects the birth rates that um, Dr. Stewart was yes. referring to before. So that's the period of time when the birth yes. rates were particularly high. So there were more students being born, and so that's why the number went up. So, so that 13 that. to 17 route probably reflects more of 13, 14, and yes, 15, exactly. 16, 17. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. All right. And so uh, to <laughs> under, further understand how these births and, and kindergarten enrollment is playing out in our current in our uh, current and previous enrollment, so those students who would those that kindergarten cohort that would have came in in school year 12, 13, they are now in sixth grade. And so what we see when we look at the change in enrollment from our most recent peak of 1415 to 1819, we can see that those elementary grades uh, are where we're experiencing just the raw, the largest raw change. Uh, and then when we <coughs> get to the cohorts that were a part of that uh, time period when births in kindergarten enrollment was increasing, we can see that um, between fourth and eighth grade, that uh, trend is uh, pretty consistent in terms of those numbers increasing. So at sixth grade, if we look at uh, the difference, we actually have an increase of sixth graders, the broad number of sixth graders, even though uh, when we look at the grade progression ratio, it is about 95%, where the average has been about 98% in the past five or six years. So, um, this data is incredibly uh, impressive, and I want to thank you for bringing it to us. I have to confess that I'm having a hard time okay. with the narrative versus looking at these charts, which I okay. just am not getting. So for me, and maybe others, could each, you did it before, could you just take an example like you did, pick a number under mm -hmm. a year and say here's this and here's that, and that supports what I just said, so, so we can understand okay. the numbers. All right. So yeah. if you take a look at the kindergarten enrollment um, from when we had our peak uh, kindergarten enrollment to now, uh, we can see that the, the change has been from about 7,200 to 6,200. So almost 1,100 decrease in kindergarten students from that time period where we had that huge increase. And so then when we follow uh, those students through the grades, so in school year 12, 13, uh, having a little trouble seeing the screen, the kindergarten enrollment was 7271. And so then if you follow the bold line diagonally, that'll be how many of um, the students from that cohort are now in the next grade. And so now in school year 1819, those students are in the sixth grade. Uh, right, so we do normally have a, um, based on our grade progression ratio, we, that, that's normal, that we have that type of uh, decrease right. over the grades, right. Uh, but the important thing here is um, more so thinking about how this relates to our current enrollment. So a question that we get all the time is what's happening at sixth grade? What does that transition at sixth grade look like? And it's a bit, com it's a bit complicated picture because of just this particular time period and how the enrollment is impacted by births. But, and but, so but could I just also say when you say normal, mm -hmm. we don't mean normal as an accepted, that's how we want it, that's how it yes. will occur. We yes. mean that that is the past pattern yes. that we are trying to disrupt yes. through the work yes. of the enrollment task force, yes. correct? Yes. Great, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, going back to uh, the transition six, uh, sixth grade, to at sixth grade, okay, when we go across from SY13 for kindergartners mm -hmm. to SY18, yep. that's based on births. 
So we lost a thousand kids. So okay. uh, that, that's what the, the numbers okay. are. Okay. Okay. But when you go down yes. to fifth grade, yes. SY18, that's based on other exogenous factors away from births, mm -hmm. correct? Right. So uh, part of it is a number of things. First, right. it's the births, but then it's also uh, the grade progression ratios. So how many students are uh, exiting the district over time? But then, yes, there are other factors other than even at kindergarten. So, I mean, cause that, so, so across, we can't control. But that line going down from 72, yeah. 71, the 62, 69, we hopefully we can find the factors and control that, correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. so the delta that, yeah, the top that, is that, that so matters a lot is, is the 72, 71 mm -hmm. minus the 59, 66. Right? Yes. Because they entered kindergarten <laughs> in, in two, 12, yes. 13. Yes. And by the time they get to sixth grade, we've lost 1,305 students. Yes. That, that's the number I'm worried right. about. Right. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's the diagonals that matter. Yes. We, can, yes. we, can, we, can, we can hope to control. Yeah. We yeah. can't control it, everything. But yeah. I mean, I, I do, ideally, yeah. technically speaking, you could increase your capture rate for kindergarten, but it's already high. It's already high. Well, it's returning back to sort of average levels at 70%. Yeah, right. That's what's happening right now. And let me just... Oh, I guess that's the mistake I was making with the number yeah. Andy pointed yeah. out. I was looking at that 83% in public kindergarten. Right. Whatever. I don't want to... I, I, right. I'm and just starting to understand it, so I don't want to confuse myself. Yeah, if she gets a capture rate of 75%, she's happy. But we're getting 70. Right. And maybe a few more kids, too. Right. But I do want to just um, step back a bit and just preface this. But the reason why we're going through this um, is that at least part of what we do is um, do the 10-year enrollment projections. And all of this information about kindergarten enrollment, grade progression ratios feed into that. So when I get into the slides about what the projections look like, this will help inform why they look the way that they do. Uh, in addition, uh, just even emphasizing what has happened during this uh, really unusual time period just before and after the recession and how that's playing into our current enrollment. Uh, not Definitely not to say that uh, what we're doing uh, doesn't inf currently doesn't influence and won't influence and won't influence what we um, what happens with enrollment over time. It's just giving some context that we had previously um, uh, put forth and to also explain what the enrollment projections look like right now. I, I know you desperately want to move forward. Just another question. Sure. Um, I've, t I've talked a lot about, I know other commissioners feel strongly about the integration between the projections that we do related to enrollment and the population of the city in general. Yes. And the city's loss of population and the city's going through the same exercise as we are. They want to increase that population. <laughs> they're investing in neighborhoods. They're investing in things that they believe will keep people here on, in schools or be part of that. So how does that play into either the, the look back or the look forward in terms of what, what we lost, what, five or 6,000 people yep. at least in the interim census. Mm -hmm. So some of that, it, that's an, exo an exogenous factor. People leave yes. the city, they're no longer sending their kids to our schools. Okay. But how is that factored into the, these, these projections or analyses of things that we can control and not control related to the loss of population for the city in general? So we will be looking further on in the presentation about the connection between enrollment and housing. Uh, so I will say that while the overall population um, isn't usually included, what we've had to do this year was establish a floor in terms of uh, when we look at our enrollment projections, we do a three-year average and we took of uh, enrollment and um, also grade progression ratio. We did a number of things to change the methodology this year to look at a longer trend because if we just looked at three years, uh, it, I don't think that it would be reflective of what we actually expect to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be just a really dire decrease that we don't really expect. So what we did this year was, uh, as a part of the methodology for enrollment projections, we used population change um, and trends to set a floor um, and develop uh, what we call a crude birth rate um, so that it's not usually how we uh, normally capture, um, I'm sorry, a crude capture rate. It's usually not what we use, but we incorporated the population numbers uh, into that so that 
we could establish okay. a floor of what we expect to happen. Okay. Uh, and then uh, what we are doing is, as I said before, this is really just a, a summary level information. What we want to be able to do is to uh, start to take into account some of these exogenous factors, as you mentioned, and uh, start to really um, uh, drill down on what that relationship between birth and enrollment is so we can start to understand things like uh, permits, population, how many um, students under 18 actually live in a city when we start to develop these trends beyond sort of this basic summary that we've done looking at just enrollment and uh, kindergarten enrollment and births during this time period. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, and so now that we looked at what uh, happened in the past, um, we are looking at what's happening um, going towards uh, the future in our enrollment projections. And what we see when we look at the most recent year of birth data is that we are expecting uh, another uh, decline. We experienced another decline similar to that decline in 2009 and 2010. And so then that uh, plays a part in our enrollment projections. So based on the, uh, that expected- Nicole, we have another question, sorry. Commissioner Hassan. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Stewart. Um, the, if you can go back to, I'm sorry, to slide 12. Yes. This is overall across the city. These counts? Yeah, yeah. so the birth rates. Do yes. we have this desegregated by zip code so that we can look more intentionally at where we're closing or opening schools or where we're adding seats? So we don't have birth, well, we could develop them um, I mean, for, by neighborhood, but we, uh, yes. I, not necessary immediately, but I think it might be helpful long-term planning and looking and saying, okay, yep, we know we're going to have this dip, but if we're going to have a dip that's bigger in a particular geographic area, helping inform the city of that. And right. Certainly. So, that's a good idea. Thank you. And so when we get to what the um, enrollment projections look, look like for um, the next 10 years, we start by looking at this uh, kindergarten enrollment and what the, uh, what the projections look like based on what we just saw in, in terms of uh, the expected decline in births. So we do expect to um, hit a decline in births in school year uh, 2023. And so that's when the kindergarten cohort would enroll from uh, the most recent year of births that we saw where there was a decline. But we do expect that the kindergarten enrollment would then uh, level out at about 5,700. And then the, this is the um, chart of projections by year. And so uh, I just want to preface this with a number of things. First, projections are not promises. Uh, and uh, we take into account a number of different things like births and capture rates, but it definitely do does not tell the full story of what's happening in city schools. It also is a long time period. Ten years is a long time to project um, uh, 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 enrollment. And what we find is when we, you get beyond five years, they, these, the more recent trends that you base your projections on, they then become compounded over time. So we did try to adjust the floor of where we think um, the enrollment may decrease, uh, but um, it's still reflecting a decrease, but one that is not necessarily fully informed by all the things that are happening. Right, and this just reiterates what um, I just noted in terms of the limitations of doing 10-year enrollment projections. And you know, we aren't the only LEA who experiences um, uh, a bit of frustration around doing enrollment projections for 10 years. Uh, so that is something that the L other LEAs also uh, talk about, trying and you know thinking through what the methodology is and what to include. So that's not something that's unique to Baltimore City. The only thing that is unique is we just happen to be in this um, uh, um, the last few years declining enrollment. And so how do we account for that? So, as I said, you know, there are a number of things going on in city schools in, uh, impacting enrollment policy, 
um, and uh, various other enrollment initiatives across the district, uh, from creating the new engagement office, um, the continued promotion of early learning, the day of play that was um, mentioned earlier. We have a, um, a new welcome center that's coming online, the expansion of very, pro very programming, um, aligning pre-K offerings uh, across the city, looking at, continue to look at, at the middle grade strategy and the enrollment task force, and continue to look at ways to re-engage students who are, who are in the district. So I would uh, temper the enrollment projections as a, uh, a starting point for the, with, based on the information that we have. So in terms of utilization targets, the reason why, part of the reason why we do the enrollment projections, we also have to look at um, utilization projections um, as part of the 21st century buildings plan. And as you all um, are aware, we have an 86% target for a school year 1920. <coughs> so there are a number of ways that uh, city schools is moving towards that target, a number of the portfolio changes um, over time. This is a list of all the things that we've done just in the last year. And then when we get into how that's changed uh, the number of seats that are in the district and what the utilization looks like, we can see a number of things. One is that the number of seats that are coming off, off uh, line this year has, has greatly contributes to that. So almost over 5,000 seats. So we're surplusing uh, Dr. Roland Patterson, Lake Clifton, um, uh, Harriet Tubman becomes swing space. And Gilmore has also um, been surplus. So that contributes to a decrease in the number of seats. Uh, and that actually allows us to reach a utilization uh, for 1920, a projected utilization in 1920 at 87%, where our target has been 86%. Dr. Stewart, um, is it also a companion analysis on the loss of the purposeful loss of seats around charters, charter closures? Do they also result in, they don't affect the utilization so rate? If they're not in our buildings, no. Mm -hmm. So we did talk about future analysis that would be helpful is to look at new school creation and the correlation between new school creation, I think, is getting at one of your questions, um, and and these trends in terms of the degree to which we're, um, our capture rates are better or our um, grade progression ratios are higher, and if that's a relation, if there's a relationship between some of the new school creation or some or school closures. Yeah. All right. So uh, moving through this, this is just a chart showing what the uh, seat deficit and, um, and surplus is currently. So what will be in 1920, so as I mentioned, we'll be at 87%, and we'll still have a, <coughs> uh, we'll still need to reduce, reduce seats that, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, actually, that's not what that says. Um, so this just shows what it is in the current year. But what we should remember is, um, there will also be seats coming online as a part of 21st century, so we will have in the further years out after 1920, we'll have some additional seats based on new 21st century buildings opening, so that will play into what our utilization looks like long term, uh, coupled with what we um, what the enrollment projections indicate. And so if we are in a situation where the enrollment continues to decline and then we are getting more seats because 21st century um, buildings are opening without additional closures, uh, then we will um, see that utilization decrease. All right, so to your question, um, uh, Commissioner Frank, what, uh, what I wanted to do is just talk really briefly about what we already currently do uh, around trying to understand the relationship between enrollment and housing. So every year, facilities planning, we get data from um, uh, Baltimore planning, and uh, we look at where the permits are across the city, uh, where the developments have been approved or things that are under construction, and we use our student yield uh, calculator to then um, look at what the potential yield might be from some of these developments. Uh, and so this is information that we use every year when we're in discussions around our portfolio to understand what things might be impacting what's going on in a neighborhood. One thing to remember is that these things aren't, these aren't yields of new students that, that 
that's a caveat there. This could be students who are moving from other areas in Baltimore City into these new developments. And so that is um, one thing to consider when looking at uh, student yield for housing. Uh, the other thing that um, we at Facilities Planning are working on, so their uh, DHCD, the Department of Housing and Community Development with the city, they just released their um, housing framework or their development framework outlining a number of different strategies for how they expect to impact um, or how they move forward with community development uh, across the city. And so the framework is implemented through the neighborhood sub-cabinet, which is coordinated by the mayor's office. It includes a number of different public agencies, uh, community development finance institutions, uh, and it's really about coordination across those agencies uh, in order to, to develop a, ro a really holistic view of community development across the city. And so city schools, um, the Department of Planning, we've been participating in uh, both the neighborhood sub-cabinet and the middle neighborhoods work group. Um, and really what we've been doing sort of in these first steps is identifying with that intersection of those major interse uh, major um, initiatives <coughs> and city schools looks like. So as a part of the um, um, uh, neighborhood impact areas, which are mapped here, we're looking, we look at what is the intersection with the actual schools that are in those neighborhoods, uh, which include two 21st century uh, schools. So part of it is sort of just beginning to understand the context. And then the next piece is um, uh, really uh, providing that context in order to inform policies and programs and funding that uh, these different initiatives are taking on, including uh, the middle neighborhood uh, work group, which is a work group of the sub cabinet. Uh, so initially just looking at what the middle neighborhoods are across the city uh, based on the housing market typology and looking at the different uh, zones that intersect with those neighborhoods. And then uh, as part of the um, a bag school center neighborhood investment initiative working with ONI and 21st century uh, to just dig in a little bit more deeply with the 21st century schools and the communities that are directly uh, surrounding those schools. And this just highlights that we are continuing to work um, as a part of the 21st Century Cities Initiative, um, the research grant that we got uh, as, uh, alongside um, Johns Hopkins and Baltimore City Planning. We're continuing that work looking at the intersection of uh, housing and enrollment and some of those trends. This is just a snap, I won't spend time on this at all. This is just a snapshot of the 21st century profiles that I mentioned that we're doing. So we're looking at where the students are coming from, what the academic focus of the schools might be, uh, what the in zone and out of zone rates look like and what the utilization of rates look like. Just providing some general information about what's happening um, across the uh, 21st century schools that have opened. Is it, I, I know it's too soon to yes. know this, but over time, is there a way for us to measure the extent to which the investment in new schools is retaining students or attracting students that might go elsewhere? Uh, so that might go elsewhere. We would have to look I, at... When I say elsewhere, I mean leaving the district. So are, are these investments keeping families in the district and or attracting families? I, we can't know that because right. we just opened them, but something over time might be... So there are a number of other different efforts uh, that are happening. Some other um, researchers that are um, uh, looking at 21st century as well. So between what they are doing and what we can do with the data we have, or even if there is um, a need to do other things to understand the impact of 21st century, I think that's something that we've uh, talked about. And this is just a snapshot of um, some of the things that we're doing in terms of data visualization and uh, story maps, uh, just to really um, inform what's happened in the past and what's happening currently around uh, city schools. And so we're looking at doing one based on um, the portfolio and also translating some of the information from the CEFP, which is a very dense document, into some visualization and story maps so that the public um, has access to more of our data and information. And 
uh, just some of the other highlights. Uh, what's in the appendix here that we didn't get to um, is, is some more information about transitions at sixth grade, so understanding uh, uh, that transition from fifth to sixth and um, how students are exiting the district, what neighborhoods they live in. We'll also be doing that at the, uh, for the eighth to ninth transition. Um, some more, inform more information about in and out of zone cohort analysis. Uh, because you know these trends that we talked about today are trends citywide, but there are different things happening in different neighborhoods and different zones across the city. And so digging in there so we can understand um, what's happening at different schools or in different zones. And then um, looking more at that private versus public school enrollment, um, not just by kindergarten, but what's also happening at the other grades. And we'll be submitting the CFMP uh, on July 1st, and then the, um, the June 20th is when we present to the Planning Commission and then submit it to the IAC on July 1st. So that is all. Wow. It's a lot of stuff. <laughs> no, it's a lot, of, a lot to thank chew you, on. Dr. So Stewart. thank you very Mostly much. And, and I think uh, people were good about asking questions during the presentation. Are there any other uh, questions? Yeah, I do have one other question. Um, which is, again, not this year, and it's very impressive, and thank you for, for bringing it to us and presenting it in a way that we can understand it, so yeah. thanks. Um, over time, is there a way to measure um, enrollment growth in a more micro way, in the sense of looking at our portfolio and seeing, is there, are there trends among our portfolio where we're seeing growth or we're seeing losses or things are static over time so we can get a sense and the public can get a sense of where these where these big losses are occurring and maybe there are no trends maybe it's just mm -hmm. across the board but maybe there's information that would be helpful for all of us if we knew that in fact these trends there are places where the trends are different from they mm -hmm. are aggregated across the city mm -hmm. and why is that and what might we learn from that so it'd be useful you know again <laughs> next year maybe to look at that as a metric and something useful that would inform this. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Bondema, then Commissioner yes, Richardson. Dr. Stewart, this sounds like a um, deja vu from last <laughs> our operation meeting. Yes. And what we're talking about here is exactly what we talked about before doing a good qualitative study would be interesting yes. to connect the quantitative qualitative together mm -hmm. because there's a lot of pieces here that would be just interesting. And we talked about that a lot at the, at the operation meeting. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Richardson. Um, I wanted to piggyback off of um, Commissioner Frank's comment to also look at where in the district mm -hmm. we have high demand for a product, mm -hmm. right? And, and and use that as Is information to question? possibly replicate so that we could capture more students who or families who want that particular, you know, thing that that school's offering. Commissioner Richardson, so disaggregation, it, the, the, the across the district trends and numbers are helpful, but um, where are we providing people with what they want? People will travel tremendous different distances to get what they want. That's if we know this in this in this town. So, so that's the, we need disaggregation. Commissioner Reed, thank you, Nicole. Uh, I guess one thing Nicole is probably remiss in. She probably stopped at slide thirty. But if you go to slide 35 to 46, you'll see some of the data that's going to answer some of the questions you may have. Yes. So, uh, I mean, that's some good data in those pages that you didn't cover. 35 on. Yeah, I just want to repeat right. that. You went over that, and all the good stuff uh, from what you're talking about is in that in, in the appendix. I tried to be mindful of time. Huh? I tried to be mindful of time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how successful I was. I know. Um, but I will say that we have this... Uh, this is just a PowerPoint. So we have a, this lovely document <laughs> called the Comprehensive Educational Facilities Master Plan. It's 700 pages. And so we do a lot of disaggregation in that document. So we're trying to balance in these presentations what to present versus you know, how much is too much. Uh, and, and if there are other you know, forms uh, in which we can present some of the disaggregated information, I would be more than happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we're going to get back. You got something? No, I, I was just going to say another thank you to Dr. Stewart just for continuing to, to push the level of analysis and I think the feedback from the 
the board will help us also move to the next level. So thank you for your work. Including to read the appendix. Including to read the appendix. Um, we're going to get back on track now. Um, the only uh, special recognition group that signed up tonight is the BTU, um, Mr. Hendricks and Ms. Thompson. Right this time. Uh, Except the orange shirt. You missed that. I, you know what? I'm just saying. I got you. I got you. You got to share that joke with everybody because I know they probably think we're crazy. Uh, you're right, right? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, uh, that last presentation just wow. Um, that was a lot. So, I commend all the work that you all do. Uh, first of all, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Madam CEO, board members. Once again, I saw you two weeks ago. My name is George Hendricks. I'm a full representative at the Baltimore Teachers Union. I'm joined here today with Mr. Corey Gaber. Um, Y'all probably know who he is, but that's Corey. Um, I've been working, long, working with Corey quite some time because he's my, one of my building reps at one of my schools. Um, Commissioner James Hassan actually alluded to a lot of what I was going to talk about today in reference to the policy meeting that was held last Tuesday. Um, the surprise of having the unannounced formal observation for teachers um, my phone has been blowing up. I actually ran into a few people over the three-day weekend that I had, and that was a concern that uh, teachers brought to my attention about the unannounced. And when uh, we were presented with that information, it was say it said that that's what other LEAs do. Um, I just want to just make note that we are not other LEAs. We are city schools. We are Baltimore City. We are unique in everything that we do. We are great at the things that we do. So moving forward, um, you know, we, we have some challenges that, I'm quite sure that the board, as well as B2, will continue to work to fix. Um, we need to fix our, our certified teachers that we that we recruit and that we retain. Um, that's one of the big uh, reasons or the big issues that teachers have because we have a lot of teachers that are actually teaching outside our area certification. That's a big concern of theirs. Um, you know, you, you're just coming in to observe me. And, you know, I haven't been teaching this thing. You know, I'm not certified to teach this thing, but I understand there's a need that you have in your school so teachers are placed in there. So Dr. Hassan actually said a lot. Um, I hope that you all will come to that policy meeting. That is a very big, heavy topic right now uh, with the staff members, with the teachers of BTU. Um, and I will not be before you long because I was just here two weeks ago. And um, I like talking, but it's late. Corey. Corey? My name's Corey Gaber. I'm a sixth grade literacy teacher and also um, a elementary vice president on the teacher chapter side of the executive board of the Baltimore Teachers Union. And um, I wanted to speak today because I listened to the video of the policy meeting um, that happened that George was just alluding to. And Commissioner Hassan uh, extended an olive branch saying, we're interested and excited to um, have a relationship with the Baltimore Teachers Union where there is good work that needs to be done that we can partner on. We want to know how we can further that relationship and further that work. And I, I really took that seriously and appreciated that. And I was thinking about what would that take? What would, could that work look like? And I thought about my classroom. Um, I have six habits of scholarship on the wall. One of the habits of scholarship is integrity. And we define integrity as I do what I say I'm going to do. If I'm not able to do what I say I'm going to do, I quickly reach out to communicate, um, to take ownership, and to set a new commitment for when I can get done what I said I was going to get done before, and also that I do the right thing even when nobody is looking. And to me, that integrity feels like the heart of a productive relationship between any human beings. And so to me, what's it going to take for increasing that good work we can do together, it starts with integrity. And so we've had a couple of great experiences recently with um, uh, Mr. Grant Skinner, uh, Daniel Heller, where we've had partnerships with the district, uh, teachers working together, and we felt like when folks said they were going to do something, they did it. They put resources, manpower, time behind what they said they were going to do. When there's communications, there was prompt and full responses, and that was lovely. And those are the types of things where we say, yes, we are excited and delighted to work with those folks because of the relationships that have been built. And we've also had things on the opposite end of the spectrum where we've had partnerships where people have said they're going to do something, have not followed through on their word, have not responded to communications until after repeated efforts. We've had to reach up and up 
to say, listen, please, like we're not getting any response here. When are we going to get a response to these questions? And those sorts of interactions make you think there's not integrity here. There's not a good faith relationship. And those are places where we're not interested in working further. And so the things that I'd say is, um, as we look towards building this relationship is integrity and accountability going both ways. If we say we're going to do something, we're asking that you follow through on that end. And that means also not, you know, good faith means not misrepresenting teacher input. So if we had a building rep meeting where folks said, listen, we talked to you about what evaluation could look like. And there was not a mention of unofficial, I'm sorry, uh, formal unannounced observations, which the teachers were unanimously against, of course. But to then have a slide up there saying, listen, we had all these input from people. And also, this is one of the, the biggest change we're asking for. There's a clear place where people are going to infer that that was talked about and gotten community input. And that wasn't the case. So that's misleading. And that's the types of things that make you think there isn't good faith and isn't integrity. And we hope that there can be accountability when those things happen that can fix that on that side and invite the accountability coming back on our end, where if we say we're going to do something um, and we don't follow through, that you hold us accountable the same way. And so those are just some of my initial thoughts. And as we're working together, that being the basis, um, considering that there's a history of often hurt and distrust sometimes. Thank you very much. Very, thank, very helpful. OK, we're good. Thanks. Thank you. We're now going to have general public comment. Um, I've been getting some pretty consistent feedback that I'm a little too lenient on the time. So I'm going to, I'm not, into, I'm not trying to be rude, but we're, the, the public comment is three minutes per sign up. So even when you have a teammate, I'm looking at you, Alice and, and Maggie, uh, Margaret, uh, even when you have a teammate, it's still three minutes. So I, I'm going to be consistent um, with that tonight and going forward. So our first guests are um, Allison Schechter and Margaret Williams. Good evening. For the record, I've never gone over time, <laughs> but thank you. Hi, I'm Allison Schechter, founder and director of Baltimore Montessori Public Charter School. I'm speaking here tonight to follow up on the request submitted and presented two weeks ago to increase our enrollment cap at Baltimore Montessori. It's interesting timing after the presentation tonight um, on enrollment because what we are hoping is to get this request approved on June 11th so that we can be a partner in the enrollment strategy. We have Continued, our students come from 26 zip codes across the city. So as you say, people will travel for a methodology or school that they're looking for. We continue to have over 1,000 students on the wait list every year. And about 50% of those are at the early childhood level. Our request is to be able to increase at the pre-K and kindergarten level by being able to add four classrooms that will increase access at that point, and then also still have seats available to have access at sixth grade. Something else I would like to note is not only can we help to increase the capture rate that you've been speaking of and provide a high quality early childhood option in time for current recommendations, um, also 50% of our um, enrollment at that level comes from private school and home school. So it is a way to bring more revenue into the district and to provide a high quality option and partner with the district on their enrollment strategy. I would like to pass it off to Margaret Williams, who's an early childhood expert we're so fortunate to have in our city. Good evening. Thank you, um, Chairman Kashani and members of the commission. It's a real honor to be here. Thanks for the time, which I hope I will not use up. Um, I'm the executive director of Maryland Family Network, the state's foremost advocate for care and education issues for children prenatal to age five. Um, I'm also, full disclosure, a member of the Kerwin Commission and honored to be so. Um, you, I don't have to tell you the first five years last forever. 90% of the brain is grown by the time a child reaches age six. Learning is cumulative. What you learn today builds on everything that came before. So it is absolutely critical that children have a wonderful start in life. In Baltimore City, there are roughly 750 regulated providers of early care and education. Um, so that's where most children birth to five are in Baltimore City. Less than 10% of those slots are of high quality. Um, so expansion 
to early care and education of early care and education slots um, through Montessori public charter, for instance, is really critical, and I urge your favorable consideration of this request. Thank you. Thank you very much, and to both of you for all that you do. Privilege. Seriously, no, you're, it's back at you. <laughs> Thank you. Our next guest is Keisha Goodwin. Hello, CEO, Chair, and Board Commissioners. Today I'm here to discuss the accuracy of community thoughts conveyed on policies to the school board meetings. After attending several meetings, then listening to presenters for those policies dis discussed, what transpired through the meetings has brought about great concerns. So basically I'm saying I attended several meetings, and then I went to a school board meeting, and the presenter presented the policy, and then they discussed what transpired in those community meetings. However, it was not quite accurate, and in that regard, I have concerns. We all know that distrust causes disengagement. This school year, stakeholders mentioned in the grading policy meetings that they did not want district nor state mandated assessments included in students' quality grades. Also, teachers who attended those meetings said that if they were to be responsible for inputting weekly grades, that they wanted to also have extra planning time to do so. However, these thoughts were not conveyed during the grading policy presentation in a school board meeting. Another community meeting took place on April 2nd in reference to the sex discrimination policy. In that meeting, stakeholders discussed for a lengthy amount of time about bathrooms, time spent uh, on sports, and also some time was spent on pronouns when it came to our um, transgender and identity piece. However, the Title IX presenter only mentioned a part of the discussion that took place after the meeting was adjourned about student discipline. And just to mention another community meeting, because it is good to mention meetings in series, this meeting actually was canceled without notifying the public and not rescheduled, and uh, there was not another date rescheduled for it. And this was the graduation requirements meeting. I expect that in the future, community stakeholder engagement will be more meaningful and transparent in the information that is delivered and received by the district and will be presented to the school board with integrity. Thank you. Questions, comments? Thank you. You always make us aware of something that we probably didn't know. Thank you. Thank you. Our next guest is Kim Truhart. Good evening. Three minutes is not enough. Okay, thank you for taking my letter um, or my concerns um, seriously and addressing them later. Um, it is outrageous that this city, majority black, has black elected officials who don't seem to love black children. And, and I'm tired of it, okay? Um, the city school contribution from Baltimore city government is flat. 278 million last year, and they're proposing 278 again this year. Tomorrow night is taxpayer night. Baltimore, y'all hear me? Tomorrow night, 5 o'clock, City Hall is taxpayer night. Show up. 
you cannot tell me that the funding should be flat to our schools. Our children need help. I appreciate what you ladies and gentlemen are doing tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, is it? 1030. But six young people were introduced to the prison, the, the, the school to prison pipeline Saturday night. What are we going to do for now? Honor and memorialize the 12 who left us. But there are six who are about to just get into all kinds of craziness because they were arrested in the harbor Saturday night. Let's reach out to them as well. Um, Principal Eugenia Young talked about her student um, paid positions and whatever she's doing. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, sounds like it's integrated in her curriculum at her high school. And I don't know if that's just yo, or is that something that will move with her into her new position. But I think it's worth looking at. Um, I love Dr. Stewart. Um, and she needs to go down to the Department of Planning, but we'll talk about that later. Um, no, what do you mean, leave um, here to go there? It, it, she, <laughs> oh, okay. we'll talk about it. Um, the the deal um, with that is, as our student population and city population decline, is the folks who are left poor? And, and if so, if we can articulate that somehow, because as far as I'm concerned, the poorer we get as a population in the city the more needs our children have, the more costly it will be. And I think it is critically important that if you're going to do these kinds of analytical machinations that you present to us all the data. Because right now, declining or enrollment, is it, is it poor people need more services? Does that make sense? It does. And the, the last point, I'm, I'm gone. I'm gone. The last point is I need data. I got a grant from the Family League along with another hundred or so people, and they're asking me to key in data about city school students, and I'm refusing. Y'all got the data. Give me a flat file with the names and the grades and the schools because this is absolutely ridiculous. Kim, uh, yeah. Uh, data. No, I hear you. And I apologize for going over, you're, but you're, I need that. Got it. And we had another call for disaggregation of the data. Our next guest is Chris Pabst. Good evening, Dr. Santelisis and Chair Kashani. My name is Chris Pabst with Fox 45. I came here tonight because I felt like I didn't have any other choice. We've been trying to get an interview with you for the past year and a half to talk about the recent public records lawsuit between Fox 45 and Baltimore City Public Schools. We believe that we have a series of questions that taxpayers deserve to have answers to, and I felt that I felt that this was the only place that I could come to to get in front of you two because I've been trying to for the past year and a half, and you have declined all of our requests. So I, I have some questions that I would just like to run through and hopefully get some answers from you because we feel the taxpayers deserve to have answers to these questions. In the recent court ruling, Judge Jeannie Hong said that city schools willfully and knowingly violated the law by not releasing the public documents that we requested. I believe taxpayers have a right to know who made that decision to violate the law, according to the judge. Has that person or have those people been held accountable? This school board and Dr. Santelisis is constantly saying that city schools does not have enough money. Can you explain why you did not release the documents when we requested them? That decision cost taxpayers $175,000 that the judge ordered this school board to pay Fox 45 for legal reimbursements. What do you say to taxpayers who had to pay that money? Do you owe them an apology for spending their money in such a way when you're constantly asking the state for more money because you say you do not have enough. 
Both of the internal investigations that we requested, the most two recent ones, at NACA and at Calverton, found that grade changing is happening in Baltimore City public schools. Those are the documents that you did not want us to have and did not want us to read. We now have them as a result of this lawsuit. And your own investigator said grade changing is happening. What is this school board doing to address those concerns from the investigator and the conclusion that he reached? My last question is this. Your own investigator gave a series of recommendations in the NACA and the Calverton investigations suggesting that the school board tackle the issue of grade changing, address policies in grade changing, address regulations in grade changing. I would like to know what this school board has done in response to your own investigators' recommendations concerning the investigations at NACA and the investigations at Calverton. I appreciate your time tonight. Fox 45 appreciates your time tonight, and I hope that we can get some answers for taxpayers. Terrific. Thank you for coming. Any, any questions? We're good. No answers? Not right now, no. And we actually missed our PAPST as I uh, referenced outside. Um, we'll continue to reference you to our statements um, that we've made in the past. We have answered, and you are more than free, which I will say again, uh, for you, for the public. You can submit your questions to Ms. Fullerton, which is the process, and we will continue to provide you answers. But thank you for coming this evening. So if I send you an email specifically so asking for, for who made the decision to violate we, the law, you we, will send me an you answer. You can submit, Mr. Pabst. You are more than free to continue to submit your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our final guest this evening is Sekou Cosimo. Madam Chair, Dr. Santa Lisa. And uh, commissioners. Madam Chair, Dr. Santalisis, and commissioners. The word black is uh, an adjective, a descriptive word. They tell you what you look like, but not who you are. The proper name of a people should always reflect land, history, and culture. In order for our children to learn, they have to be under control. Right now, they're out of control. They don't know who they are, where they are, and what their historic duties and responsibilities are. They have to be made aware of that. It's amazing that there are a lot of educators with degrees who don't understand the importance of culture and the ethnic identity that flows therefrom. At Douglas High School, these children are angry. They are angry about social injustice, economic injustice. It's going to take folk who have experienced that type of injustice to help them want to learn. No pedagogy will work if the children have no interest in learning. Once they are given an interest, you're not going to stop them from learning. I experienced that personally. I got my first introduction, introduction to African culture at Douglas High School in 1964. A very brave geography teacher named Miss Davis showed us herself standing on the equator in Africa. And we were very impressed. But it wasn't continued. We have a problem with security at the school. There are 70 cameras, 26 of them are broke inside the building. The children know, put the camera to the test, act out in front of the camera. If there are no consequences, you know that camera don't work. It didn't take them long to figure it out. We have four cameras outside the building that don't work. Between the cell phones, these broken cameras, the school is out of control. No learning is going to take place until we get them under control. So between now and September, I'm hoping that this board is going to put things in place to deal with the problem of the cell phones 
in the, in the broken uh, security cameras. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cosmo. And thank you for your presence at Frederick Douglass. As a result of the public comment, I'd like to ask board members if there's any additional items they'd like to pull from the consent agenda. With that, I'd like to have a motion to approve the items that uh, we agreed would go by consent. Items 8.01, 2, and 3. Item 11.01 .01, and item 13.01. Do I have a motion? Moved by Commissioner Richardson, second by Commissioner Frank. All in favor? Commissioner McFadden, Hassan, Bondima, Chinia, Kashani, Reed, Frank, Berkeley, Richardson. Motion passes 9-0. We had a number of items that were pulled. Um, first one is item 8.04, the school program renaming request, William Pinder Hughes Elementary Middle. Andy, you and I both had questions, so when Angela's ready, you can just ask yours first. Good evening, um, Board of School Commissioners. I'm Angela Alvarez. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of New Initiatives. And I'm Lindsay Anderson. I'm a specialist in the Office of New Initiatives. So thank you. Um, I, I don't have the presentation in front of me, but it was, again, um, as I say often, the presentation was terrific. The process you followed was, was really outstanding. Uh, the community engagement process, I thought, and the surveys. My only question um, is one of the term academy. And I could be wrong, but um, it's a term that I think in Baltimore is associated with charters and not traditional schools. And I wonder whether there is anything in Comar. It, does the term academy have any legal significance? Um, again, I could be wrong about this with traditional schools, but applying it to a traditional school um, it, there's nothing that would prevent that from happening by Comar or any other regulation. So I'm going I'm to let Lindsay answer that yeah. question. Okay. So there's 32 schools in Baltimore City that have academy in the name of the school. There are traditional schools and charter schools. Right. Um, so okay. Stuart Hill Academic Academy is one of them. Renaissance Academy, New Era Academy are all traditional schools. Very good. That's what I didn't know. Thanks. Um, just uh, If you could just remind me a little bit about the process. Um, when I looked at this, I remember that for one of the 21st century school, we also had school and community votes. And in that case, we, we also, um, there was a heavy deference to the student vote, which I, I can sort of get intellectually. But I just, if you could just help me understand this a little bit, because the votes here were a little more closer than I'm used to seeing. Yeah. For um, some of the options. Yeah. So one of the things that was really important for us is that we're creating a clean slate for these school communities, that they see themselves as one. Um, and so... Um, we used that planning committee that we had engaged with early on around um, helping us develop the recommendation for which where the school will be located, which building. Um, it's also helping us with the academic planning to kind of lead and engage the work. So I'm going to um, turn it to Lindsay to kind of talk more thoroughly about how we did that and, and why the committee felt strongly that student voice needed to be the lever in this particular case. Right, so as Angela said, the planning committee that we've been working with for a year and a half um, really felt strongly about doing this process now so that students from both schools could start the school year on kind of equal footing, not Gilmore students and Pinderhue students, but one school community. Um, and they helped us through this process. So since we came uh, to you last time in April, we've had um, several opportunities for the community to come out and learn about the renaming process and the options. We had um, students in every single class in both schools vote. Um, and then we had a voting window where parents could come into the school office and vote in person or vote online. 
Um, and then May 9th, we had our uh, a transition committee meeting where we talked about the vote counts and um, finalized a recommendation that came from that community group. So members of that community group who helped us uh, form this recommendation were the Witherspoon family who have been with us um, throughout this process, um, the No Boundaries Coalition, um, Elder Amelia Harris from Newborn Holistic Ministries, and Clergy United to Transform Sandtown. Um, we also had school leadership from both schools um, in support of the recommendation that came from the committee. And um, I think they, uh, they wanted to go with the name that was most popular with the students because they feel strongly that they want this school identity to be something that students embrace and are excited about. So that committee was in favor of, of, of the student? Yeah, this, yes. it, it was their, the it was their recommendation. Been, okay, and they're the people that have been involved a lot. Okay. Yep. I think I, I, think I didn't read that correctly. Okay, thank you. That, Commissioner? So just to add, to help for clarification for anyone that's listening, there's another difference that's happened between this and the 21st century school naming, and that's that we now have a naming policy around, around how to name schools. So that doesn't do to the vote total side by side, but if anybody's also making it, but we, we did it differently before, we didn't have a policy before on, or a procedure on how to do it. Yeah, it was less for me about the procedure and more about the, the there was a heavy deference in that case too, because there was some questions out at Wildwood. I mean, so anyway, I, I, I was remembering a process point. Um, thank you, that, that actually answers my questions. Uh, may I have a motion to approve item 8.04? Moved by Commissioner Hassan, second by Commissioner Richardson, all in favor? Commissioners McFadden, Hassan, Bondima, Chinia, Kashani, Reed, Frank, Berkeley, Richardson. Motion passes 9 0. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. And just one more thing while we have members of the public for um, historic names or names of significance within that community, we're in conversations with the community about how to name parts of the building or how to honor those people within the building. Um, so that's something we'll likely bring, bring bringing to you in the future. But that is something we're cognizant of um, and working with that planning committee to decide how to do that best. Maybe an opportunity to acknowledge and recognize Miss Ennis yes. in the school. Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Next item is uh, 12.01, the software maintenance and support. Oh, here they come. It's intimidating now. <laughs> the team. Here's the team. Um, it, this... Um, this is less about um, my general lack of s technological sophistication, so because we could be, be here all night trying to explain this all to me. Um, I do think that um, we do need a full. I'll let Commissioner Hassan re-emphasize this: the, the request of, of a full picture of all of the, how this all fits together. But um, there's a lot of items on. Uh, different vendors doing different things. I'm not questioning that they all matter, even though a full matrix would help me understand how it all fits together. But in light of uh, what's been in the news a lot about the security or absence of security on our city government systems, um, from my reading of that list, it looks like only the daily computers for Palo Alto 5250 for content filtering and firewall um, it looks to me like that $103,000 item is the only vendor on the list that deals with cybersecurity. Is that, is that true? And if it, A, is that true? And B, is $103,000 all we're spending on our cybersecurity? And then I have a series of sub-questions. Yeah, you're, sh you're both smiling and probably laughing at me and, and shaking your head. So that's a good sign that the answer is no. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, Sashi Budala, Interim Chief Information Technology Officer. Uh, number one, um, in the last operations uh, meeting, we presented the comprehensive IT technology update, and we also spoke about the, the strategies, what we're working on and everything. But we can definitely circle back on that and make sure that we provide some information around how these things tie up. We can definitely do that. Um, going back to your question, um, security is built into every line item what you see in that, right? For example, ERP, um, 
obviously you have to rely on that vendor uh, to make sure you're getting the latest updates as those patches, making sure our systems are protected. Uh, you have antivirus, uh, making sure our end user devices are protected. So there's a lot of security items pretty much um, in every of the line item which is mentioned there. specifically on cybersecurity. So that's helpful. So it's not a, a one line item thing. It's it's part of all the items, I, I, vendors, contracts, I get that. But specifically on cybersecurity, and again, I'm, I'm playing off of what we've also been reading in the newspaper. Do we self-insure against cybersecurity threats? We have a cyber, um, you know, a policy right now, insurance policy. We just uh, did it. Uh, last month, so we have that in place. Um, but again, over last one month, we have done, uh, last one year, we have done significant uh, things on the cybersecurity front, all the way from making sure all of our servers and systems are patched up and uh, have the latest updates. Uh, that is a significant thing, because if you, uh, if you don't have your systems up to date, uh, because technology is changing every mm -hmm. second, every minute, right? You have to make sure your systems are patched up and you're protected. So that's something which we really uh, work on to make sure that all our systems are protected. Now, what's happening with your city government? And uh, obviously, there's a lot of stuff happening. Uh, so we, 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 we spend a lot of time making sure our systems are protected. OK. Um, I, I, you might have just answered it, um, so maybe it's a, tech, a term terminology thing. What you just said, uh, would you consider that a full assessment of our vulnerabilities when you said you've you've checked all the servers and machines and yes and I, I guess I should just ask it straight up have we done a full vulnerability assessment yes we we, we we did a complete vulnerability assessment of all of our core infrastructure to make sure they have the latest patch set and they're up to date to make sure that we are protected with the threats what we have from the cyber um, you know bad actors I would say but again I would say uh, commissioner that uh, cyber security and protecting the system is a journey, right? You're good, whatever you're good today, but it, it, it's changing every day, it's evolving every day. Uh, the cyber criminals have become very uh, extremely smart and they come up with different ways to attack you and uh, and we want to make sure we are we are ahead of the game and uh, investing the time, resources, and making sure everything in our know, systems are protected and making sure our employee data and student data is protected at all times. I, I think from your earlier answer, this might be difficult, so I certainly don't need a response now. But um, since since, since we do spend more than $103,000 on cybersecurity, is there um, any way to provide the board with um, information about what how much we do spend on security? Yeah, I, I can provide a breakdown of that. that but again, just to give you a high level, like today's board letter is about software updates. We rely on a lot of vendors all the way from, you know, your student information system to your payroll system to your human capital system to your financial system to your, your ticketing system to your Microsoft Office and your email system, right? It's a whole laundry list. And we have to provide this software or pay these vendors to make sure that all those patches and updates, what I was talking about before, we get that from our vendors so that our systems are protected. Okay. I would say an estimate of that would be helpful. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Just to give us, it, uh, like, our own little security that we're, you're giving me security and comfort now, but I'd, it'd be nice to know that it's like it's a number, that it's a big number. Sure, absolutely. I'm sorry, that's a very unsophisticated way of saying this, but I, that's, you know what I mean. Sure. Do you have anything else you want to say about this? Uh, no, just to reiterate the desire for the board to get an overall arching sure. plan. Um, IT really, impacts everything, operations, HVAC, our, our distribution of our police force, assessments, curriculum, instruction, all of it. So to be able to see and ensure that we are advocating enough resources for maintenance, for upkeep, for professional development, for assessment of fidelity to implementation, those kinds of things, because it, it's a lot of money, but it's also such a vulnerable point for us to be able to make more informed decisions. It's really hard for me to vote on it when I don't know sort of how is this transactionally getting us to a big, hairy, audacious goal, you know, and sort of how are we hacking Baltimore City Schools to find IT solutions 
for challenging opportunities and problems. And so sure. to see that big picture would help me be able to vote with more confidence on a $4 million change on an annual basis. So. Okay. Do I have a motion? Are you have a, uh, are we speaking to ER? Are we speaking to ERM? Is that basically what we're talking about? You know, I mean, basically, we're talking about risk and cost of risk, cost relative to risk. So aren't we talking about inter enterprise risk management in terms of what we need to look at? I mean, unless I'm looking at something different. I don't, I don't, I'm, it's a term of art, I don't. No, again, what I can answer is the cyber, uh, from the cyber insurance point of view, Commissioner Reed. but again, enterprise is, you know, risk is a much larger um, right. thing, you know. Because we're worried about the whole system. So. That's a way to boil it down, yeah. call it what it is. Yeah. Do I have a motion to approve item 12.01? Moved by Commissioner Reed, second by Commissioner Richardson. All in favor? Commissioners uh, McFadden, Bondima, Chinia, Kashani, Reed, Frank, Berkeley, John uh, Richardson. Uh, all, all opposed? Um, abstentions? Motion passes 8 0 with one abstention. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I'm going to guess that, Blaine, are you going to be for 1302, 1303, and 1304? Okay. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. It's a two, yeah. um, on the janitorial services, 1302, um, I noted that, um, that each contract is to comply with the Maryland Education Annotated Code with respect to procurement of green product cleaning supplies. I just was curious, given the fair student funding and um, principals making decisions all across the city about their janitorial services and their vendors, how do we monitor that? I mean, it's a big deal to have kids not exposed to the toxic chemicals in the cleaning supplies. Um, I think that research is pretty well documented now. So I, I, I love it that we're, especially with our sustainability policy, that we're there and it's now written into the contract. But I am curious about the monitoring of it. Well, in the... Uh in the beginning of the uh, specification, we put a uh, qualification in there to um, state that they have to use green products as well as uh, meet with us prior to or after the award. All the vendors will meet with my liaison that we restructured in our team. We have one person by the name of Quinn Woods who will be a liaison between the principal and facility operations with regard to custodial specifications and commitment. Um, with regards to their cleanliness, the products use, and any other questions that they may have. So in addition to that, we do have um, random checks throughout the district, but we do have one person that will be a point person assigned specifically for the um, contract. We also say that the, there's five of ten that meet the school's cleanliness requirements. Um, does this, do these cleanliness checks, does, does that also does that, is that an, a, a way to check on this as well? Yes. What he'll do is he'll survey the schools um, on a monthly basis. He'll do, set up a set number of um, schools to visit in a month. He'll go in there, review with the custodial staff the, the, um, the products that they're using. He'll go in the classrooms to check for dust, the floor conditions, um, window ledges, um, bathroom partitions, areas that might have some... Uh, Problems. problems throughout the day or throughout the week and maintain that it's up and if there is neglect or an area that he feels that's not concentrated in he'll redirect the staff and notify the vendor or the BCPS custodial staff there with the principal okay one final question I, I do we have we started to ask vendors the janitorial vendors to help with recycling because I know that when I went in the, with the green schools that we support with my other hat at the Baltimore Community Foundation, it seems like it falls off an awful lot to students to work with their teachers to get that done. And, you know, keeping, I, there's, I've never seen a cost benefit analysis, but keeping stuff out of the waste stream has got to help for, with our tipping costs. The, um, through our sustainability staff, Joanna, Sonia, 
she's got some donations to help us offset the the difference with Johns Hopkins has provided us bins from their transition of new bins, and we've been placing them in schools to offset the difference in um, the collection of trash. And we also, with the cooperation of the city, we do have a recycling bin outside that's you generally picked up once a month, I mean once a week, and then we have our um, other trash there. So we are we are trying to separate, but there are times when other our regular things contaminated. And we have to deal with that. But, for but the do the part, janitorial contracts, do they help? Do they, they pick up the trash? Do they also collect the recycling? They do, yes. As the school, if the school is active and they set up the particular bins to provide that, they are instructed to provide the plastics and paper to the recycling bin and the, like the food compost and everything else to the regular bin. So, so then the janitorial staff will collect that and take it to a separate, the separate, uh, Bin or uh, they are directed outside. to do so. Yes, and we do check on that when we do our inspections. Okay. <laughs> okay. I will be sure to check on that because yeah, I too. care a lot about this. We will. Yep. Um, motion to approve item thirteen point zero two. Moved by Commissioner Richardson, second by Commissioner Berkeley. All in favor. Commissioners McFadden, Hassan, Bondima, Chinia, Kashani, Reed, Frank, Berkeley, Richardson. Motion passes 9-0. Um, same question for 1303, 1304. So I'd like to just, uh, you can answer them separately, but I'd like to vote on them at the same time. It, um, one contract, the uh, 1303 for the um, purchase of janitorial cleaning and restroom supplies was approved in January of December 12, 2017 for 500,000 and within you know a year and a half it's more than doubled um, and 1304 was approved in January 2018 so again within a year and a half it's more than tripled um, are the underlying factors that led us to put that contract out in the first place that dramatically different it, it just struck me as like a, a big I mean the 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 actual numbers relative to everything we do are relatively small, but that's a, still a lot of money. No, it is. And when we um, come to the board after we solicit the contracts, we look on past historic data, right? So we took the procurement's numbers and we tried to break it down and anticipate what our actual spending needs would be per the term of the contract. We either hit high and we're fine or we hit low or we hit right in the middle. Right now we're approximately, uh, we spent $1,095,000 for the th two, three years of the contract. We had a $1,375,000 approval limit. In order for us to continue the next 17 months under this contract terms, we are going to do one of two things. Increase the upset limit and procurement to allow the purchase of the schools to purchase or we can terminate the end of the contract this year and rebid and try to get higher numbers back in however if you're looking at 17 months that's an average of if the million we're requesting is $64,000 per month if you break that down say 165 buildings we're looking at $392 a school so Granny, just you know no no that, that's that's helpful math um, because actually I didn't do that math, so that's a helpful number. I just, um, just if, you could, if I could just finish. Um, it, it, so is this, are this, the, the demand from the schools has gone up? Because like, you, you originally projected that it would be 500,000 for the first one. Um, so they're, they're, they're asking for twice, even though it's a relatively modest number, they're, they're asking for now twice as much, which leads us to come back to increase this contract. If I can, yeah. And, I'm sorry. And, maybe I'm asking. Right. So it's. I don't think that the demand has gone up. The problem has been that the con we there's a certain limit, and then when schools hit that limit, then we have to come back to the board and make a request. And so every time we have to come back to the board to make that request, that's a time lag and a delay for schools to be ac be able to access their supplies because we've basically hit that limit. So, so what, what he's attempting to do is cr create a higher limit. So we're not coming back to the board after schools actually hit that limit. But I don't think that's. 
schools have right. actually decreased, increased no, their I, I, yeah. that's what I'm saying. I, I don't know why in December 12, 2017, we didn't ask for something closer to a million dollars. But but I you know I don't I don't want us to pad our requests. No. So I, I I it's it's still it's just a little the the, f the factor factor two factor three is right. a lot. The additional factor is that we used to also we still have another vendor to use. However, we've been getting better prices and reliability on this contractor. So we deferred the money from the one vendor we're using occasionally, but not to the degree that we're using this vendor. Okay, that's so that's the that's helpful. Yeah, because I I would I would hope that um, by putting putting out to bid an original contract for the two hundred and fifty thousand, for example, that we weren't that we didn't bias against somebody in the bidding by after the contract's awarded, then we come back and we're increasing it to nine hundred thousand. I I would hope that that doesn't have an effect on who gets the contract. Yeah. Hi, Joe Vogel, Interim Director of Procurement. Um, several years ago, we asked the board for approximately $3.2 million with some other vendors to buy these products. And over the past several years, Interline has stepped up and given us better prices. The ordering process is smoother. The delivery is smoother. So on that three point two, we have not spent a million one. Um, so I, a lot of this, the purchases We're against those yeah. are now with, with, with Interline. That's so the answer. One, one could say we're only asking for 200000 but a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of that we're shifting. You're ahead. To, you should stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you should stop. You just reached the point of understanding. <laughs> Commissioner Von Dima also has a question. You probably answered my question already. But what I don't understand, and maybe you can explain to me, is when you are evaluating, and you've been in the business a long time, but when you are evaluating um, what you want to do and um, how you want to go about doing it, you always look at the future. You always look at the future and you look at what if and the cost of the product, what it will be in the future, and you evaluate all this. So when you estimate um, how much you're going to be spending, you do that and you include that in there. And my understanding is back to the beginning, and, and I think you feel satisfied at this point, but I'm still not understanding when in the beginning you estimate the, the future cost of something, even after you look at all the other, um, where you're going to get the product. But, for, for, uh, but when you come back and double and triple, I, I get a little bit concerned because some of that should have been done in the beginning. And back to what we were just saying, sometimes when you go out for bids and put it out on the market to bid, um, and all everybody else is bidding, and I think some of the some of the companies that bid already looked at the future costs of every of the product, and then we you know you come to the board we approve it. And then one year later, it triples. Well, I that, just that, to, let me finish. And then the one year later, it triples, and um, that seems a little bit really too extreme. And I'm, I think you're satisfied with the answer. Well, the, I, and, and the reason I, I didn't mean answer. to interrupt you, I, I'm going to test for my understanding. It sounds like, if I got it now, that the overall cost, which they projected, has not changed. But when they asked for the approval the first time for the macro contract, there were multiple vendors, including Interline. That's correct. Over the since in that intervening 17 months, Interline has performed better at a lower cost with more efficient delivery. So their portion of the contract is going up, and the other portions on the other vendors will likely go unspent. So the in in total, the amount that is spent will be the same, but we've shifted it from one vendor to another. So, right? Yes. Thank you. I couldn't, I couldn't have said any of that on the tech presentation, right? <laughs> I think in the future, this could have been avoided by saying a little bit more on your write-up. Yep. Okay. Because we both had the same question, and we're sitting here thinking, well, dang, you missed the projection by a third, a half, mm -hmm. whatever the math would be. And then the only thing that I want to add to it is what I always include in, the, in my questions about just about everything, everything that we talk about, especially when it comes to money. When you are presenting to the board, it would be nice if somewhere in the conversation, somewhere in the narrative, you can include the fact that there's a strong possibility that this should change. And so when it comes to the board, again, and maybe that's not the way you do things, but when it comes back to the board, all of these questions that we might have, 
some of these questions probably could have been answered because we would expect yeah. that something like this could happen. But when we put up one cost and, um, and we say, okay, this is what it's going to be, and then a year later we get a double, triple, then it, then it, it yeah. sends a red flag up that we need more explanation of why. Yeah. And, you, and your answers are good, but it brings up questions about why. You know, so, and we talk about this about everything that we do as far as finding money and funds and everything. If you could put more into um, our, um, our narrative here where we don't have to spend time asking those kind of questions, if that's possible. As a layman, I'm not sure if that's possible, if that's done. But when you're talking to a board that's got to say yes, 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 or no, 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 it would be nice if, um, if you would add that in there. Okay? We Very helpful. Thank you. So um, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we're going to, I'll take the vote, but I want to vote at the same, on 1303 and 1304 at the same time. Um, motion to approve items 1303 and 1304 for interline brands. So Moved by Commissioner Reed. Do I have a second? Second by Commissioner Berkeley. All in favor? Commissioners McFadden, Hassan, Bondima, Chinia, Kashani, Reed, Frank, Berkeley. Motion passes 8-0 with one absent. Um, I'm just going to highlight upcoming meetings. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Um, teaching and learning is on June 4th at 3.30 in this room. PCAB is on June 6th at 6.30 in this room. Um, the board will be in executive session on June 11th at 3 upstairs. The full board will be in public meeting on June 11th at 5 in this room. Operations will meet on June 18th at 10 here, and policy will meet on June 18th at 3.30 here. Anything else for the good of the whole for this portion of the meeting? Um, motion to adjourn the meeting. Moved by Commissioner Berkeley. She raised her hand real fast for that one. Um, uh, do I have a second? Sure. Commissioner Hassan, all in favor? Commissioners McFadden, Hassan, Bondima, Kashani, Reed, Frank, Berkeley. Motion passes 7-0 with two absent.